He was the first Ivy Leaguer and one of only two linemen to ever win college football's most prestigious award. Although he considered himself to be better at baseball than football, he's the only Yale player to ever score a touchdown against fierce rivals Harvard and Princeton in every game he played against them during his glorious three-year career. It's uh, probably the one remaining record that I have at Yale, and I'm very proud of it, very proud of it. Your host, Bino Cook. In 1936, the unemployment rate was 16.9%. In the American League, the Rookie of the Year was Joe DiMaggio of the New York Yankees. And in that same year, FDR won a second term in a landslide. I have seen the agony of mothers and wives. I hate war. In March of 1936, German troops marched into the Rhineland. The world had started on the road to war. That December, the King of England gave Edward VIII picked love over the English throne. But I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility without the help and support of the woman I love. Also in 1936, Cole Porter, an alumnus of Yale, wrote a song which has stuck around a few years. The song, I Got You Under My Skin. And also in 1936, a future Yale alumnus won the Heisman Trophy. His name was Larry Kelly. You and Leon Hart, the end for Notre Dame, 1949, won the Heisman Trophy. You won it. Do you think a lineman will ever win it again? Not ever, no. The hype that goes with the emphasis on scoring and the ability of, of uh, running backs, uh, not, not by the remotest possibility is will a, a lineman ever win it again. 1933 at Yale, freshman, did you have a lot of competition to make the first team freshman? My roommate and I, Jack Wright, ended up on the seventh freshman team. Uh, it didn't take too long for us to work up to the first team. Most of the students and the players at Yale at the time were from prep school, but were there any high school players on your freshman team? Not too many. They came from they Andover? They came from Andover, Exeter, uh, Groton. I remember one uh, fella from Groton who was a, a supposedly a superb ball player, and uh, we eliminated him early. It's 900 a year. How did you afford that? Scholarship program. Of how much was scholarship? Uh, eventually, I turned out to be uh, all of it. And the 900, was that just, uh, Larry, was that just tuition, or was that, did that include uh, room and board? Room and board and tuition. 900. The whole ball of wax. Uh, it's now something like 25 or 26,000. From high school scrub to college icon. After this. First time you went onto the field of the Yale Bowl as a member of the varsity, what did it feel like? We played, our first game was against Columbia my sophomore year, and I didn't start. I came in about midway in the second quarter. Uh, I caught a touchdown pass, and uh, the, from then on, the thing was easy. The 1934 Princeton Yale game is one of the great games in the history of college football. Tell me about that game and your role. We lined up for the uh, uh, national anthem, 66 ball players on the Princeton side and 28 
on the Yale side. The traveling squad. Traveling squad was 28 members. Uh, Princeton was favored by, oh, something like five to one or 35 points, whichever you chose. We won the game seven to nothing, and, and uh, that was a, a great, tremendous victory, and uh, one that we will never forget, believe me. Princeton outscored us, or uh, out uh, statistic us in pass receptions. We, we scored, we uh, threw nine passes and completed three. And one to you. One to me. For a touchdown. Yeah. That was, Princeton was headed kind of to the Rose Bowl until then. Uh, they had already turned down a Rose Bowl invitation, I believe. But I'm trying to point out here, the Ivy League was pretty good in those years. Uh, your non-league games, you, would, you, you had a, one year you played Navy. Uh, you played we, played, we played Army, we played Navy, we played Michigan. Uh, did you beat Michigan or did they beat No, you? Michigan beat us 15-13 after we had led them 13 to nothing in the, into the fourth quarter. The crowds of the Yale games in those days, what were they like? We averaged probably 48 to 60,000. Uh, not quite like they are today when we I was up to the Yale-Princeton game this past season, and we thought I had a good crowd of 18, 18,000. You grew up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Were you a good high school player? No. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you one little story about it. The football coach at high, Williamsport High School, who, when I learned that I was going to Yale, said the only way he'll ever get into the Yale Bowl is to pay his way in. And he was right. Because at that time, from his point of view, uh, I was not a polished performer by any means. What was Williamsport like in those days, Williamsport, Pennsylvania? A typical small town, medium-sized town of some 42,000 people uh, who had the normal interests and the normal prejudices and uh, was very livable. The home atmosphere, what was it like? Uh, very friendly, very concerned, very caring. Did your mother and, and your dad, have you done your homework? I mean, were they on you about your grades? I, I studied. It was not difficult for me. It was very easy. And uh, I, went, I didn't feel any pressure. I didn't have any pressure because I didn't need it. You also played other sports in high school. What were they? Basketball and track and uh, uh, extracurricular, shall we say, baseball. I played semi-pro baseball. But you went to prep school one year uh, before you went to Yale. You went to Petty in New Jersey. For educational purposes and for athletic purposes, it was the smartest thing I ever did. You played high school football. You weren't that good. But you were an excellent student, and you were only 16 years old when you graduated from high school. Yeah. Is that why you went to prep school? Uh, really, I was undecided about college. I was uh, immature. I had not reached my best uh, physical capacities. Uh, I think mentally I was aware and uh, capable, but I just wasn't socially mature enough to, to face the college separation from my family. You went to Petty. Did you grow? Did you get bigger? Did you become a bigger, better football player? Uh, I grew academically, socially, and physically. Unlike a lot of people who get away from home for the first time, I was never homesick. I was always interested in what was going on, what I was learning, what, it was, what I was developing, and uh, that took my attention, and uh, it was not directed towards Williamsport. Did you pay your own way to Petty? I mean, your, did your parents pay your way, or did you have a scholarship? It's pretty hard to answer, because times were so tough in those days with the, the depth of the Depression that uh, Petty existed only from its student body's income and uh, whatever they could get above a certain subsistence level was a, a bonus. I, I, uh, I went to, to Petty for $300. You have two Heisman trophies. The Downtown Athletic Club gives you one. You have one at home. But you have the other one, not at Yale, but at Petty. Why? Uh, because I think Petty had the greatest influence on in my life. Larry's Heistown, New Jersey home is only minutes from the school that helped shape his life. The thing that I look back upon is the change of my lifestyle and the uh, recognition of what was going on in the world changed from uh, drastically from uh, high school to petty.
football triumphs and regrets after this. Yale had a role at the time, or a policy of the head coach had to be a Yale alumnus. Yeah, traditionally, uh, the captain from one year had always coached the next year's team. That goes back into the 1890s. It's real, real uh, uh, traditional. And uh, when the time came that the coaching situation was a little upset and not satisfactory, uh, Yale went out to look for a, a, a different type of coach. They found one, but uh, he wasn't an alumnus, and that didn't sit too well with the, the uh, tradition of uh, alumni coaching. So they compromised. Ducky Pond became the head coach, and Greasy Neal uh, became the backfield coach. He was the uh, strategist, the uh, brain, the, the meat of the offense, really. Yeah, Greasy Neal was the coach who took Washington Jefferson to the Rose Bowl against California, nothing to nothing. He also coached later in the pros and won titles for the Philadelphia Eagles. Was he good? Was it obvious he was good? Oh, he was, he was, he was a fine coach. 1936, Yale-Princeton, another great game in the history of college football. You and the Heisman Trophy winner of 1937, Clint Frank, the late Clint Frank. Tell me about that game and tell me about Clint Frank. Clint, Clint was a tremendous ball player. He was very aggressive, very quick. He wasn't particularly fast, and uh, uh, he wore glasses. During the game? Uh, no, not during uh, the game, but <laughs> perhaps it would have helped if he had. As, uh, most of the th uh, time, Downfield beyond the 10 yards uh, was a big blur to him. So we hooked up with uh, passes, but we threw the spots. You only lost one game uh, in your senior year. You lost to Dartmouth 11-7. What do you remember about that game? The finale, the last five seconds. We had a chance. There was a, 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 an interference call on, on the other end, in the end zone. So we got a first down on the one-yard line. I didn't realize that Clint was not in the ball game. Clint Frank was not in the ball game because I felt there was a cinch. Clint Frank for one yard is a gone thing. He, he no problem at all. But a fellow named Billy Albinger, who wasn't quite up to Clint's capacity, took the ball and, and uh, didn't make it. We were offside on the play, so we were penalized five yards and got another chance. We called Hesburgh uh, favorite play, a, a weak side reverse. Unfortunately, if I had had my wits about me, uh, as captain, I had the privilege of overruling a quarterback. I would have countermanded the reverse play and called another play in which I went and received the pass. But I, I wasn't, uh, wasn't quick enough and smart enough, so we lost the ball game. I've always regretted that. I mean, even 50 years, 60 years yeah, later, you yes. think about it? I still think about it. That's unbelievable. Yep. A college hero returns to his roots after this.
you played three years. You played a lot, didn't you? Out of what did you think you averaged once you became a starter? How many minutes a game? Uh, my senior year, I played uh, eight dog games, six of them for 60 minutes, and I I totaled the greatest number of minutes on, on the squad. I missed about 35 minutes of, of, of competition out of 40, 480. Not bad. Not uh, bad. Well, I enjoyed it. You averaged how many catches a year? Uh, 16. 16. 16. Yet you managed to score on touchdown passes every year against your hated rivals, Harvard and Princeton. That had to be great satisfaction. It's uh, probably the one remaining record that I have at Yale, and I'm very proud of it. Very proud of it. You played the basketball and baseball. You were you, what did you play in baseball? First base. You were pretty. You were actually better in baseball and, and football. Did you feel that way? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I was a better baseball player. I had uh, offers from New York Yankees and the St. Louis uh, Cardinals. Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey uh, thought I was a good enough ball player to to uh, sign on with the Cardinals. Between uh, my sophomore and junior year, we went to Japan to play baseball. You were in Japan a few years before uh, you know, World War II started, maybe five or six years. Was there any anti-American feeling when you were there? We weren't conscious. Yes, yes, there was. We weren't totally conscious of the fact that uh, uh, there was anti-American feeling, but uh, we could see the military preparations. For example, uh, when we sailed into Yokohama Harbor, no cameras were permitted. But you enjoyed it, I mean, being over there to play the game. Uh, we had a good time playing the game. Uh, they have a totally different attitude. It's interesting. Uh, the Japanese salute an error, for example, by laughing or hissing. Uh, they don't boo. It, it's a uh, D class. You have your degree in 1937. You're the most famous first baseman in the history of Yale baseball until George Bush comes along. What did you do? Went back to Petty and, and uh, taught mathematics and, and coached football. When the headmaster, Dr. Saunders, came up to see me at uh, Yale in my room and talked to me about it, and I had uh, an, an ambition to, to coach, continue football, to continue with athletics, and uh, he just hit the right spot. Well, then you have a lot of Yale alumni say, hey, come come with us. You won the Heisman Trophy. Uh, you were a great football player. Of course. But you weren't interested. Uh, not particularly. I didn't think that would be my cup of tea. At Petty, you got room and board. What was your starting salary? You can recall. I think now uh, Dr. Saunders at the time said, please don't tell what you're earning because of the other faculty members. I think now I can reveal it. I got $2,000 a year. The headmaster at Petty was a great influence in your life. Yes, Dr. Saunders was that. He uh, came to Petty in 1935 when Petty was just about being wiped off the map for economic reasons. He cut to the bone, did everything possible, and kept the school going. And uh, uh, he was a tremendous influence on me. Did you enjoy coaching? Yes, I did. Uh, my problem was that I was not a really good and successful coach because I expected performances from uh, my players, sort of like the quality that I had in my God-given talents of coordination, speed, and all that. And uh, when they couldn't perform like that, I was disappointed. But. Uh, I enjoyed the relationship with the boys, and, and uh, I, I still have boys that I coached in just a short five years who keep in touch with me. What a champion holds dearest after this. <laughs>
this is an interesting one. Yale graduate Larry Kelly, the Heisman Trophy winner in 1936, shared old football memories with me and his wife, a former commander in the United States Navy. I asked Larry how he first met Mary Ruth. She's a local girl, Heightstown. And I met her through her brother, whom I played golf with, uh, when I spent the time between 1937 and 1941 here. And then we went our separate ways for umpteen years and finally got together again in the, when I came back to Petty in 1970. And then it was clear sailing from there on. In your house, you're the enlisted man because your wife was an officer in the United States Navy. What's that like? I take orders very well. So now we're at World War II. Yeah. And you want to enlist and you find out two things about your health. You had no idea. During football, I had uh, had ear problems. And I, I discovered in my physical examination that both eardrums were punctured from football. And uh, rather than be 4F, which I, I, I couldn't take, uh, I got a 2B classification by enlisting in uh, uh, a war industry. After World War II, did you return to Petty? No, I decided to take a shot at the business world and see what it was like. And, and uh, I wandered around in various jobs and, and uh, had a pretty good experience, but uh, Finally, I got tired of it. Money never has been your object. I mean, it hasn't, it's never been an obsession with you, has it? No. Be comfortable, yes. Excess money, uh, I don't have any great uh, ambitions. I don't have any great desires to travel the world or to, to remake the world either, or to have a huge success. I had my success in college. I'm content to coast from there on. You left the business world, where did you go? I went to Cheshire Academy. Uh, an old Yaley, class of 13, uh, had founded it at the Roxbury School. What was his name? Arthur Sheriff, a tremendous guy, a wonderful guy. I loved him. His, his touch and his administration and his uh, capacity for handling kids was tremendous. He, he, he ranks up there with Mr. Sa Dr. Saunders, in my opinion. You came back to Petty from Cheshire? Yes. What made you come back? Uh, the headmaster, Mr. Sheriff, uh, was forced out by the trustees as too old. And it just so happened that the job of alumni director at Petty was open at that time, and they were looking for a candidate, and I applied and got accepted. It was a good choice for me. Was the Heisman Trophy thing beginning to get bigger in your life? It was taking on more significance all the time. You realize it's a very exclusive club. What's it like to be in it and see these other players when you do see them? They're a real joy. It's fun to see the different capacities, the different abilities. Uh, they're all good football players, obviously. But their individual characteristics are... are uh, very different, and it's, it's nice to, to associate with them and learn from them and uh, uh, associate with them is uh, it's a pleasure. As you look back at your life, any regrets? None. Your epitaph, what do you want to be remembered? Uh, I don't think I'm ready to consider that for a few years yet. Well, I agree, but when it does happen, uh, I'll, I'll have to take time to think of that one. Then. But I, I would like to think of uh, uh, getting along with the, uh, basically the kids at school, the kids that I taught, the kids that I coached, uh, and the student body in general. I enjoyed them, young people.